Okay, good morning. Good morning. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, much better. Look, we got to operate at the energy level of this conference so far. Has this been fantastic or not? Huh? Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Uh, my name is James Cash. For those of you I haven't met, and I am the least important person, of course, down at the front of the room here, uh, I am going to dispense with saying anything about these outstanding panelists uh, that we have so that we can actually take advantage of the very brief time we have together, uh, fully hearing from them and uh, then hearing uh, your questions. We're going to try and allocate uh, about half our time to the panelists uh, sharing thoughts uh, with us and uh, the other half to uh, Q&A from, uh, uh, from you guys. I should just share with you that the, I asked the panelists to consider three questions. Now, again, uh, they will uh, say what they want, uh, but uh, 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 the three questions I had them consider were first, uh, in terms of a life or leadership <laughs> challenge that you had to overcome, was there one really significant that, one that you'd like to share with the group? Uh, secondly, if you had one thing you could do over, what would it be? And the third question was, what is the one piece of advice you wished someone had given you? Okay? Uh, you have in your red uh, booklets the, the bios of our panelists, so again, I'm not going to spend time going through it. Uh, Mary Callahan Erdos is on page 24. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Secretary Franklin's on page 26, and Abigail Johnson, or better known as Abby Johnson, on page 33. So again, please take the time to read the incredible background, and we've seen at least uh, Mary Callahan and Secretary Franklin on videos to this point. So again, we want to thank all of you for allocating time to be here. Look, we're just going to go in alphabetical order, so Mary Callahan, why don't we start with you? Lucky me. I, uh, I, I run J.P. Morgan Asset Management, and it starts with an A, and that's what Jamie Dimon does every time we have stuff that we do with the company. Let's start now about order. It's, you know, I'm going to call it wealth and asset. <laughs> so I'm not going to change husbands, but um, anyway. So thank you, Professor, for uh, for bringing us all together, and thank you all for uh, being here. I'm. Um, it's always so exciting when you come back to campus and you feel like you could actually be coming back here again, wouldn't that be a really exciting moment? Because that would be the do-over. I have so many things I would do over <clears throat> if I were starting again um, at business school. But um, one of the, the, first, the first question that was asked was, give a challenge that you had to overcome. And I thought, like, a challenge. They're now <laughs> hourly at this point. And, um, and so we, we, we work through them all. But there's, there's actually, in, in all that I do, I, I, I have the great fortune uh, privilege of overseeing the asset and wealth management business for J.P. Morgan, which is um, about $2 trillion of assets uh, across 35 different countries and uh, 19,000 people, which just so you know is not as big as what we'll get to at the end of the panel. Um, she runs a much bigger and uh, super successful uh, asset management business. But uh, with my little humble thing that I have to manage, uh, it's um, it's a challenge every day, but, the, but a lot of the challenges that I just per personally face as I think about what I go through every day um, have, a, have a very similar vein. And I was thinking through you know, sort of how do you crystallize that to a group of people in a, in a quick couple of minutes. And I, um, I remember just three years ago, I was given this job. <coughs> Prior to this job, I was running half of asset and wealth management, the wealth management piece, which is the global private bank, which in and of itself is a great and big and wonderful uh, entity and you meet with lots of clients all the time and you have lots of stresses and you have clients that are losing money and they're happy or unhappy or, or, or what have you. But three years ago I was asked um, by Jamie to run asset and wealth management which is one of the four lines of business in JP Morgan. And what that does is double my responsibilities but actually was more of a quantum leap in responsibility. Um, it was twice the business size but it also made me a member of the J.P. Morgan Operating Committee. Um, it made me uh, sit on the 48th floor with the management team. It made me, for better or for worse, report directly to Jamie Dimon. <laughs> and um, and uh, was one of the, uh, one of only two women on the Operating Committee. Um, and very importantly, the youngest 
not only of the operating committee, but also I was younger than all the people that I was managing. Um, so mm -hmm. all of those sort of set up a dynamic that, that is challenging. What happens in the first, you know, couple of months of your job? Everybody congratulates you. They think you're doing great. They, can I help? You know, this is really awesome. They come visit you in your big fancy office. You know, all, everything feels wonderful, exciting, new, fresh. You have lots of energy, you have great visions of what you do. And, and I never really realized why the 100-day plan was so important. But there's something that happens at about three months where they forget to congratulate you. <laughs> they have no more patience for you know you being new in the job, and all of a sudden you're you're in charge, and every problem is now yours. It's not the last person's, and every human human resource issue is yours, and you have to make it, and all the bad stuff bubbles up. And so I found myself at about three months. <clears throat> it was about January, uh, three three years ago exactly trying to keep my head above water as I was, I was working through all of these things. And I, you know, I thought I had my cool together. I sort of pull myself together every morning, show up early, work through lots of problems. I don't know if you can still hear me. <coughs> work through lots of problems. Um, and it felt a little overwhelmed, but didn't ever try to show that to the outside. And one day, one of my partners from the 48th floor, there's only a few of us up there, came in my office and s closed the door behind him, which is not really what we do. We have an open door policy on our floor. And I was like, this is it. yes. <laughs> and he said, I'm here as a friend, not as a colleague. You need to get your, he didn't use this word, act together. <laughs> now, you look disheveled, you look stressed, you look frazzled, and everyone is expecting you to not be any of those things. And you're going to lose the confidence of your people and your peers if you don't get your stuff together. You're here all hours, and yet you don't seem to be getting it underneath you. Get it together. And just leaves. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting there like, did I look that bad today? Like, I, 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 went, I, I opened the closet, it has a little mirror on it, so I'm looking at myself and I'm thinking like, oh. And that's the best piece of advice I ever got. Because from then on, he said, you, your feet can go like this all you want underneath you. But you're a duck across the water. And that's, that's what leaders are. And all of us have that, whether we take on new board positions, whether they're trying to do things for our work and school and charity. And, and, and I thought that was a, a fabulous lesson, which, um, which I've given to a few other people right. as, they've taken, right. as they've taken jobs. Great, right. great, great story. <clears throat> Secretary Franklin. Are we answering all the questions? Yeah, I can answer the other ones, or we can keep going through why don't, the Why don't we go through? How would you like? OK. Well, I have to say something here. Because the class of 64 had 12 women in it and 680 men. And I cannot begin to tell you how thrilling it is for me <laughs> to be back here with, with this really energetic group and these two young <laughs> dynamic <laughs> women that I'm sitting here with. This is just astonishing. And I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm just so thrilled. I'll be talking about this for, forever. Great. Um, Great. And you know, back in those days, uh, no computers, no iPads. It was typewriters and slide rules. I got good with the slide rule. <laughs> I haven't touched one since. Um, leadership challenge. I'd like to talk a little about something that happened early in my career. Uh, I was 31 years old at the time. This is more than 40 years ago. It was the early 70s. And it was this uh, chapter uh, in the White House. I was at Citibank at the time, and I was an assistant vice president. There were three women assistant vice presidents, no women full vice presidents in the bank, if you can imagine. When I got a call to come to the White House to create a new function, which was to, in turn, recruit women for policy-making jobs in the federal government. Um, I believed in the cause, needless to say, but I needed to satisfy myself that this was serious. And it was serious. And I uh, took a leave from the bank and decided to do it. 
against the advice of a whole lot of people. Friends who said, don't do that, you'll ruin your career, that administration will never do anything for women. Well, I decided, I guess I found out much later in life, I'm a bit of a risk taker. <laughs> this was a little bit risky, but I believed in, in the, the cause, so I decided I was gonna do it. So I, <clears throat> I landed there, and uh, long story short here, but there was a three-pronged effort that the president had started. And let me tell you what the prongs were. The first one was that he asked his cabinet secretaries and agency heads for action plans in their departments and agencies how they were going to advance women. There were m numbers, there were targets in these plans. He wanted to know who was going to be in charge and he wanted them back in a month. I was the second piece of this action to come in here and recruit for the policy making jobs and monitor the action plans, the progress on these action plans. And the third piece was a woman named Jane Spain who came to watch over women in the career civil service. Uh, this uh, was an interesting experience. <laughs> I, I think I have to, to tell you the backdrop because some of you are probably too young to remember, but in our society at that time, there really was not consensus about women in careers. And there wasn't, and, and if you were having a career, there were certain places you could have a career, but not other places. And there was also not consensus about whether careers and families really went together. And we had quite a, a, a male um, culture in that White House. And to give you an example of that, you know the women's movement was, was going on and there was a little bit of noise and bra burning and all of that. And one of those men one day took me to something and introduced me as the president's new recruiter of women. And he said, I'm pleased to tell you she's wearing a bra. <laughs> now, that's a true, you can't imagine that today he gets sued. <laughs> I have been waiting all these years to introduce him. <laughs> In the, uh, to show you the insensitivity of the time, uh, my job title, I, they put me in front of the press after two weeks. I had no, I had no experience at, at this. And the first question out of the box is, how can you recruit women when your title is staff <coughs> assistant to the president for executive manpower? <laughs> I didn't get it either. That got changed <laughs> very quickly. The press coming out, it was a disastrous experience for me, I have to say. But, the press coming out of it was not so bad. Then I simply had to, had to do this job. I didn't know anything about recruiting. I went to executive search firms and said, can you help us out here? And they said, well, we don't have women in our files because our clients don't ask for women. So that was no help. So I had to build, what I really did was to build alliances and relationships all over the place to help me with a couple of things. One, to build my own source network so that I could get help identifying women to place. And the second piece was to help with identifying where there were gonna be job openings so I could get there first with candidates before they were disappeared because there were always uh, many more men. I'm, I'm, am I over talking here? I, I kind of get going on this <laughs> because. <laughs> um, anyway, I, that's what I did. And then the third thing was I needed help on occasion to help me outmaneuver outwit, overcome the opposition. It was 24-7. It was the president set a goal, double the number of women in the policy-making jobs in a year. Well, we did it. A lot of people helped. We, we did that before a year and after a year. We had tripled the number in those jobs. And the, to me, the important part was that most of them were in jobs that women had never held. So the barriers were broken, and they stayed broken through subsequent administrations, both sides of the aisle. Um, <laughs> those women were successful. Nobody failed. Probably because they were overqualified to begin with. <laughs> I think a little of that still goes on. Don't want to take a risk with, with a woman that you would take with men. Why did this work? Well, what I'm going to tell you now is a very Harvard Business School approach here. Do we still call it management by objectives? 
Uh, I don't know. That's we have a new name, but it's the same thing. It's the same thing? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, see how dated I am here. It, this worked because there was leadership at the top. This wouldn't, I can tell you this would not have happened. This progress advancing women would never have happened without the president because of society, because of that White House staff. So there was leadership at the top. There were goals set. There were action plans. There was monitoring. And there were rewards. The reward in this case was a note from the president. If a cabinet secretary did a good job, get a note from the president, said a good job. Mr. Target would get the, uh, the other kind of a note. And I know that because I wrote those notes. <laughs> and set them up the line so the president could send them out. Uh, I look back on this and think, wow, I'm, I'm thrilled that I was able to, to, uh, to do it. Uh, my husband has met some of those men in more recent times that I dealt with back then. And he said, has said to me more than once, how did you ever deal with those guys? <laughs> they, were, they were a tough lot. But again, uh, the, the president wanted this done, and that does make a difference. So I'm honored to have sat in that chair. Great. Thanks for sharing yeah, that. We're thankful you did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That approach seems like it would still be very relevant today. So I'm really pleased you, you walked through it for us. And for those of you who don't know, Secretary Franklin has a, a book uh, entitled A Matter of Simple Justice uh, that I've had the pleasure of reading over the last couple of weeks that goes into far more detail with fascinating pictures uh, in it. And for any, the of, hair. You, <laughs> <laughs> for any of you interested in uh, more detail in the story, that would be a good place to, uh, to find it. Lee Stout is the author of that book. I'm, I'm not, I should be clear. And, and the stories of a number of those women appointees are in that book. Yeah, yeah. And some of the stuff that went on back then, of course, would never happen now. But, but it did, because there was no recourse. You couldn't, there was sexual harassment had not been invented. And if there was discrimination, you had no place to go with it. Interesting. OK, Abby. Uh, thanks. Uh, so the first thing that I just have to say is when I was asked to join uh, this panel, uh, my reaction was quite similar to the reaction that you heard last night from uh, Cynthia Montgomery about when she was asked to, <laughs> to run this, um, which is, you know, this is way out of my comfort zone. Uh, this is not what I bring to a party. What, what I bring to the party, or a party, is uh, management and thoughts and ideas on, on how to run a business. So anyway, uh, with that said, uh, without uh, having to think a lot about it, uh, for sure the biggest management uh, challenge I faced was making the transition from being a manager in uh, our asset management business to uh, broader general management. And uh, one thing that uh, I think Mary probably knows well is uh, asset management, where I started my career, is actually a terrific career for women. And it's a terrific career for uh, women being an investment professional because you get to work largely independently. Uh, you are responsible for your own work. You actually have a decent amount of flexibility in how you structure your time and get your work done. And I think even probably most importantly, your results are highly quantifiable. So you own your performance, and it's very clear to everyone what, what your performance is. So, um, so I spent my early, um, basically the first 10 years of my career as an investment professional, and then went on to become a uh, manager of uh, investment professionals. So after doing that for a handful or so of years, I really thought that um, I knew how to be a manager and a leader um, because, uh, because I had done that. And you know, one of the things about working in asset management uh, that um, I probably took too much for granted is that you're participating with, working with, or managing and leading people who are total type A people. They're really hardworking, they're really smart, everybody's really trying to, to win the game all the time. It's a, a tight culture that um, you get immersed in quickly and you learn quickly. And 
So as a manager of, of that area, I had uh, the benefit of, of leading so many, uh, so many talented people. And when it came to communicating with uh, these groups of investment professionals, we all spoke the same language. We all shared a culture around uh, our sense of need for continuous accomplishment because it is such, um, such a competitive business. Uh, however, when I moved, uh, I jumped out of that to go run our 401k business. And so I went from managing uh, a little over 1,000 people to running over 10,000 people. So I basically swapped managing money for managing people, uh, as it, I can see it now. And I was dealing all of a sudden with every uh, kind of personality from very um, highly compensated big ego salespeople down to uh, teams of people who were running IT projects or uh, running our mailroom, which in a 401k business is actually really important uh, to do and do well and do very efficiently. So learning how to message to a broad and varied organization like that was, was really, really different. And being prepared to transition from meeting to meeting with such uh, incredibly disparate topics and uh, different types of people who were responsible for each of these many uh, varied and, uh, and different types of, um, of assignments was, uh, was, uh, was quite interesting. And uh, then you kind of layered on top of that, what does a former fund manager actually know about running a business? Uh, that, that was a challenge to overcome too. Um, uh, looking back, I was pretty confident at the time and I think I still would say I was better at analyzing the business than anybody else. But uh, then once you've analyzed it, you have to figure out how to change it. And uh, when you're a fund manager, you get to vote with your feet, and if you don't like what's going on in a company, you sell the stock. Uh, that wasn't an option. I had, to, <laughs> I had to figure out how to make the stock go up. So. That's great. Uh, so uh, let me start with Secretary Franklin. Uh, the do-over question. If there was uh, one thing in your life you uh, could do over, do over what, well, uh, what would that's, it be? Well, that's an easy one, actually. Um, I got married a, a month after I left HBS. This was a mistake. Uh, there's nothing wrong the with The marriage or HBS or what? <laughs> no, no. The, the, the marriage. The guy was OK. There's nothing wrong with him. And that's, and that's where I got the Franklin name from, which really became the uh, professional name. The problem was that I was determined about having a career, and he said that was fine, except his definition of career was different from my definition. Mm -hmm. And over time, this, and I'm not even sure we would have known how to talk about it mm -hmm. at that time, mm -hmm. just because of the way things were in society. Um, over time, uh, this did not last. This lasted six years. There's a lot of tension in it. Um, and then in subsequent relationships, I mean, I do like men. I like women a lot, but I just like men too. I was having uh, relationships. I was not marrying them. I don't mean that, but I was. <laughs> well, I'm glad you cleared that up. Yeah. For <laughs> I was marrying all of them, but I was, uh, you know, I had some relationships. But I was doing the same thing. It was the same problem. And there was, was tension. And the more successful I became, the, the worse it got. Mm. Mm. And uh, that, uh, that sort of, I, I began to think, well, I could never possibly get married again. Mm. Well, finally, uh, this would be now uh, 28 years ago, I, I did, and I felt at the time, oh, this is either going to be another mistake or it's going to work. I felt it was a risk, but I did get married again, and it's worked <laughs> <laughs> wonderfully. Um, he was a CEO, sitting CEO at the time, Wally Barnes. He's now retired. 
who was successful, very successful himself. And he was not going to be threatened by me or my success. In fact, he was very proud of it, is to this day, and especially when I became Commerce Secretary, he loved being the spouse of the Secretary <laughs> of Commerce. Which I think, you know, it tells you something about him. Now, uh, he, one of the regrets that I have here is that I have no children of my own, because it just never worked out uh, that I was married to somebody at the right time. Uh, so I'm, I am, and that is a, a regret, that just was the way it happened. Um, but I married this wonderful family of Wally's, and it is a really nice family. It doesn't always work out that you marry into a nice family. Sometimes you marry into something different. But thanks to him, I have two stepchildren, six step-grandchildren, and nine step Great grandchildren. Oh <laughs> so this is wonderful. That's great. But there was a lot of time and energy wasted here. That's my point. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Abby? Uh, okay, well, so my first reaction when I heard this question was do over. I mean, I spend my life doing everything over. <laughs> uh, when, when you run uh, a lot of people who are doing a lot of stuff, particularly in the service business, really that's what you're doing, is going around doing a lot of stuff over and over. Now, the trick is when you're running a big company is to make sure that everybody's doing everything over all the time so that they're getting in this continual improvement mode. You wanna also try to leave uh, a little bit of time to um, encourage people to do new things, which, uh, was it, which is a challenge, but of course that's what gives your company hope of having a great future for decades to come. Uh, on a, I did take a little issue, and I cleared this ahead of time, uh -huh. so I don't think I'm getting too far out of line, but the, yeah, I'm taking my opportunity to say what I want here, I guess, that we were given here in the beginning, which is uh, the question that we've been asked here, I think impli it definitely implies, um, and Barbara used this word, regret. And uh, you can't live your life that way. I mean, have I done everything right? No. Have I made tons of mistakes? Yes. Um, but every, every time you do something that isn't right or is imperfect, um, you have to take it as an opportunity to have learned something. And I say to people over and over again, you know, don't make me make the same mistake twice. You know, and I tell myself that all the time. I'm not making the same mistake twice. I don't care. Um, I, I've learned that lesson. And I think it's an important self-preservation instinct to hold on to, to, to not look back and not uh, let yourself get caught up in, in regret. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't agree more. That was, that was basically my answer, but she's, she's very humble. We all know how successful Abby is, but she's also <laughs> produced two fabulous young ladies, and one of them sitting in the front here about to go to Dartmouth, and yeah. I think that's about the ultimate success is making. <laughs> that's really cool, and, and I feel the same way. I mean, I make mistakes like every day. And if you sit and spend your life trying to figure out which ones you're going to do over, they probably made you make better decisions the next day. And so there's none of them mm -hmm. that I would do over. All of them are constant learning. And you can't learn unless you're making mistakes. And if you're not making mistakes, you're not risking trying, being aggressive. So I don't have any regrets. I think I, I am really blessed with three young girls. For you. Um, but if I had started a little earlier, I might have had a boy that would love me through my teen their teenage years. <laughs> <laughs> I just need one who's gonna not leave me like that. Uh, that didn't happen. So that's probably it. <laughs> That's great. That's great. That's great. Well, look, with my eye on the clock, I actually want to turn to the uh, 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 participants, uh, those of you, the attendees, those of you sitting here. We have a couple of microphones that are uh, available. Uh, I'd really love to hear your questions for our panelists. Okay, We've got a couple over here down front. If you'll just wait for the microphone so that everyone can uh, can hear you. 
Thank you all. Uh, wonderful cause, and thank you so much, Professor Cash and, and ladies, for being here. It's been a very inspirational and, and really admiring your success. Um, given that obviously a lot of talented uh, atheist women and your men in the room, how did you, um, I'm going to use a word that's probably politically incorrect, but train your male counterparts who weren't necessarily as comfortable with your success or with your being in the room? Um, how did you? lead and navigate, navigate through that and kind of help them to be more um, more uh, enlightened about um, women at the table and how to really kind of conduct themselves in a way that would facilitate your continued success and see that as a partnership as opposed to um, you know being obstructionist or... or uh, great, great question. Everyone, when we start with you. I'm not sure you can train people to be enlightened, um, but it's, that's, I, I like the aspiration. Uh, I, uh, I mean, my approach has always been to uh, you really try to rally everybody to focus on the facts and to um, focus on organizing people to be aligned around common ob objectives. and. I probably have a reputation of, you know, being maybe on the margin a little too not, no nonsense in the workplace because um, I have a really busy day and I don't have a lot of time to mess around and engage in extraneous conversation. And I've kind of bottled that over over the years. So, I, but I do, you know, I think that I think it's a helpful thing because a it keeps people more productive, which gives them a chance of be maybe getting home in time for dinner, um, which one thing I really wanted to be sure to say that there are lots and lots of men who want to get home to dinner just as much mm. as the mm. women. Um, so don't be confused about that. So in the end, it, it's all about your broader culture of coming together around uh, common goals, common objectives, and a mission for for your organization and the more that you can emphasize that uh, you can make the other stuff start to slide away mm -hmm. okay. I, I, I thought if I could just chime in here because I, I, I totally agree and by the way I think that probably all of I speak for all of us and many of us in the room the the less you think about you being a woman sitting in a room yeah. with a man the less it's right. an issue you sort of have to just do your work right. um, but there, you know, there are there are people who are incredibly successful in life because they try to figure this stuff out. Ron Daniels standing sitting here in this room, and has run McKinsey as one of the most successful companies in the world, uh, and he's sitting in this room to try and constantly learn about these issues, and that that's something that I it didn't register with me. We've always had these women's group things at J.P. Morgan, and every once in a while I'm like, why is there a man in here? <laughs> like, who invited you, and why are you here? We're having a woman, woman. <laughs> and then you get smart, and you realize that those are the smartest men around. And we're going to hear from Sheryl Sandberg later. Um, we had the really, really privileged fortune of having her come to J.P. Morgan the day that her book was launched. And what we did was we had happened to be having a CEO conference uh, at the same time, and no surprise, it's about 98% male CEOs in a room. There's about 120 of them. Um, Abigail usually comes. She didn't make it this year, but um, it's a really great gathering of people. And she said, "I want to." That's the audience I want to speak to, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because we also had the women's group and whatever. Mm -hmm. And she spoke to this audience, and that was probably the most important conversation she had. And all of them took notes, asked for the book, right? You're thinking that most of the people reading Lean In are women. The really smart men who run really great companies need to understand how to help women to sit up straight at the table and have their voice heard and all those great things. So I think it's just encouraging them and feeling welcome. And if you do have a women's event or a women's gathering, you can invite a few men and not feel uh, not make them feel funny about it, but certainly just uh, a it few. Was well, you know, we don't want too many. We need to have. Okay. Can Anything can I, you'd like to add? Uh, yeah. Well, these are great comments. I agree with, with all of it. I, I, I want to just uh, take a piece of my experience and sort of turn this around, look at it a different way. During the 80s, 
when I started to join corporate boards of large public companies, and I was the only woman on those boards for probably all of that <coughs> decade, mm. this is where I, I learned to uh, think about who was around the table and who, who are going to be supportive, depending what I was trying to do. Who are going to be friends and supporters? Pick those out. Who, who are the, quote, neutrals? who might be persuaded, but aren't necessarily supported, supportive. And then who, there's always another group. I think there still is another group. And I called them Neanderthals then, and I would still probably <laughs> say the same. Those, those folks um, are the ones who need to read the book. Who, who, uh, but you can't persuade them so easily. So the one wants to be very charming to them. But don't waste, if you're trying to get something done and marshal a coalition around that table, don't spend time with people who are, who are not going to really be supportive in the end. You need to uh, develop a critical mass who will be supportive. Okay. And that's the technique I have used to get more women on boards. Interesting. OK, got another question here. Got the one back in this section. Hi. Um, I love this panel and, and so appreciate all the pearls of wisdom and uh, had the great fortune of being in Mary's study group at HBS and uh, even back then we had an all women's study group and she was already helping all of us get through HBS so it's not <laughs> 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 I, my question I guess is, is down to the literal and tactical um, you all three clearly have been and are continuing to be on top of so many details and projects and so forth just curious if you have any favorite tips or tools literally on a daily basis that have helped you stay on top of it all. Right, right. Why don't we start very quick. This mm -hmm. had some notes on the back of it for today's speech, but the front of it is my list. Mm -hmm. Every day I have a list. I just, I can't, and, it, and the day has to end with scratching off most of it or putting it on the next card. Too many things to get on the next card, but <laughs> you just everything has to have a list. Everything has to get done, and you just it's like it's like working out or brushing your teeth or you know whatever it is that you that's harder to do. You just you have to do it. It has to be part of your routine. And I would also say religious calendar management. I mean, I schedule the time I'm going to the office and the phone calls I'm going to make during the cab ride there. I, I schedule the time it's going to take me to go get the kids from school and what I'm going to do there. I schedule time for phone calls. I schedule time. And everything has to be in a schedule because otherwise your schedule takes over you. I totally agree. I'm the same, do the same kind of thing. Lists are very important to me. Scheduling phone calls, scheduling everything. Also, uh, goal setting. You know, I've got a weekly list besides the that then falls into the daily list and we have a quarterly a quarterly set of goals and you know on and on but I, I could not function otherwise and what I have always done I guess it's just I don't know uh, I've always had a diversity of things either I am doing or or trying to do and something like the Commerce Department is a huge conglomerate really so you're juggling a bunch of things I just so that's the only way I can function with, with a diversity of things, lists, lists, lists. <laughs> yeah, this is really, this is really hard and I would not ever say that it's close to being my forte. Um, it's a daily struggle. Um, I, I totally uh, agree with both what Barbara and Mary said. I mean, you gotta keep lists. Uh, you got to always have your list with you. Uh, it, the calendar management, I mean, I review the whole coming month uh, every two or three days. I mean, down to what am I doing every hour of every day for, for the coming month. And I find if I don't, uh, things, I either don't have time to schedule things that I most want to do, um, or things get pushed out and I end up spending my time on the wrong things and, you know, you just can't let that happen. Yeah, so exercise you, goes on the, the yes. list. I mean, yes. massages go on. I mean, you know, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, it's interesting because uh, the challenge of uh, urgent driving out the important mm. is right. probably yes. pretty yeah. broad based. Yes. So That's these right. are good, uh, good offerings in general. Let's go to this middle section down here. Thank you. I, I want to broaden the discussion a bit. I, I was very impressed, um, Secretary Franklin, by your ability to achieve a, a major policy change 
change efforts are so hard. <laughs> Thank and, you. And seventy percent of them fail. Uh, and, and we're talking major uh, waste of resources and people and morale. I I really like. To, it would be helpful, I think, for everyone if you can think of efforts that you have been a part of or wanted to have happen that didn't for some reason, and why you think that uh, occurred. Mm. 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 It takes a little um, thinking. J just to talk about the women thing for a moment. Um, what was helpful was the HBS approach, but also the women's movement and the noise was helpful. It created a, a, an environmental, yeah, a, a, a political expedient. And I think in the public sector that often is helpful if you're pursuing a goal, if there's some drum beating somewhere else. Um, I know that George Schultz always used to say in his book, said that some, you, you can get things done, but they don't stay settled. And that's this, this is the obverse of the same thing, but then something is, is pushing back. Um, I just can't think of something I've been that um, engaged in where, where it didn't stay settled, but I'm sure there is something. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with this gun, gun controls. Mm. I mean, th this, is, this is almost a classic, the way it's developing now and the, the pushing and pulling in, in both directions. I, I know where I would like it to go, but I, I just, um, I don't know. Well, maybe others of you have a thought about this, but I, I, I'm having trouble thinking of okay. something uh, that didn't work. In the back, please. Um, successful women get to break the rules. And one might argue successful women sort of have to break the rules. So what rules do you, or do you break or conventions do you ignore that have that might even be considered like hallmarks of your style? Oh, uh, interesting. Uh, Abby, why don't we start? Oh. <laughs> well, uh, coming from a uh, highly regulated industry, um, uh, I don't have quite the reaction to the question that, um, that you might expect. So as you were saying that, I was like, you know, it depends which rules. Uh, you, um, you know, in my business, you, there are a lot of rules you got to be really careful about not breaking. And uh, but, but I think what you're asking about is more, uh, is more the social rules, the cultural rules of your organization. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, just want to be clear about that. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the, uh, 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 what, what rules? Um, Oh, oh, I've got some. I'll I can get you. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, get me started I, here. I have a rule, and it just, it works. And again, maybe it's because I got to a position where then I started, no dinners. No yeah. work dinners. Yeah. I, I'm happy to have three breakfasts, two lunches, <laughs> but, you know, dinners are three hours. Mm -hmm. They're three hours, right? It's hard to, yeah. maybe two. They, you know, they're not great if you're not in the right setting. They interrupt everything from your family life perspective. And if you just have a rule, then things can't really seep in. You can make an exception for them. But if that's the rule, and that's my rule, and it seems to work okay. A really so a couple that, that I run into, I want to ask about your reaction to. One is uh, the strategic business discussions that happen at bars. The second is uh, okay. the golf course. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, 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 was, okay. about, I was about so, to interrupt you and say, no, no golf, yep. no golf Did outings. It. So yeah. I assume that's what you're referring to? Yeah, at, uh, yeah I mean, when yeah. I first started working in the 401k business, we had intranet sites on golf outings. I mean, you know, the golf outings had to go, and then we had to do away with the intranet sites so people knew that the golf outings <laughs> were no longer okay. <laughs> Well, sometimes, at least in, in early in my career, uh, I didn't know how to, well, I was going to dress the way I was going to dress. And um, this is where I was told, I like red. You wouldn't know it, given that we're all wearing black. <laughs> um, I was counseled not to do that, not to wear red at uh, City Mag. This was not businesslike. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think all of that now has kind of changed, but... Um, 
I remember years ago, and this must have been, she was an old lady then, Margaret Mead, and it must have been in the 80s, uh. and she was making a speech about leadership style for women and how there was no consensus about that and that it was a problem for women, you know, how you're supposed to look, how you're supposed to dress, how you're supposed to act, all of that, and that she felt that we needed to work more on that. Now, I think because there are so many different kinds of women in places where they haven't, we haven't been before, I think it's less a problem. But I still think there's an issue there. And, and some of it is just, you know, how one relates to other people. And um, I'm, a, I'm a kind of a consensus builder type. I'm capable of being confrontational, but that's not my, my natural state. And so, uh, after a while, it, once you work with people, they, they get used to what your style is. And if you're in a place where you have the power, then you can enforce whatever your style is and make it okay for others. But I still think there's a bit of a dilemma there. And we each have to find our own, uh, our own comfortable way of operating and getting things done and dealing with, with uh, others. Right, right. Okay, up uh, on this side, please. We've got a microphone down here. Any, any, uh, anyone? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> um, first of all, let me say outstanding, outstanding panels, ladies. You've done a terrific job of fresh cash as usual. Great job. Um, the question I have for you is: What's the single most important piece of advice you would give to a 28-year-old woman graduating from Harvard Business School today that has aspirations to lead an organization? Hmm. Oh, what a great question! Uh, I'll start. I, I have the good fortune of sending somebody to the incoming class this year, which I'm so thrilled about, and she's going to be fantastic. And for the women, because it's different than for the men. Never ask yourself, am I qualified for the job? The day you got the acceptance letter to Harvard Business School, that answered that question for the rest of your life. <laughs> Don't ask that question of yourself. You're qualified. Go for it. Okay. And think of yourself as a leader. Yeah. You've got to have your head there. Your mindset is leader. Uh, I, I would, a difference. Yeah, yeah. I would, uh, sorry, I would refinish. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, trust your instincts. Um, I mean, we're all different people with different strengths and capabilities, uh, <laughs> but you know, life is situational. So, uh, you're good enough to be here. When you get out there, trust your instincts. Don't let anybody steer you off your instincts because your instincts are usually pretty good. Okay. They're good enough to get you here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got uh, right in the middle here. And, uh, how did you identify? How did you identify this person? And you know, she's much younger than you, so I'm presuming it's someone that came up the ranks. If it's somebody outside the family or whatever, that's okay. Yes. But also, have each of you picked people to mentor? Do you do consciously, and or you know, or is there a you, you, you know, is it a routine thing that you do, or a select thing? And how do you identify people? I'm four for four on my HBS. The yeah. people that work for me that that well, there's others I haven't written a letter for, so. Um, it, it's um, just I work really hard on identifying young talent that I would enjoy working with. I don't actually call it mentoring. I just think it's sort of natural, whatever it is that's that's happening, and you just keep pushing them and pushing them and pushing them because generally you can see in them more than they can see in themselves, which I think is what's happened with all of us. We're here today because somebody else saw more in us than perhaps we even saw in ourselves, and. <laughs> pushing them and prodding them and saying, you can do this. And, and once you do that, they just sort of grow like, like a butterfly. And it's a really special and very rewarding for me personally to, to be a part of. So the more I can do of that, I work hard. She was my associate. She turned into a young VP. And now she'll, she'll be CEO of something someday. Great. Lucky for us. And that's something I think all of us should be doing <laughs> and, and helping uh, younger women. I think sometimes we get hung up on mentors. If you don't have one, good heavens. <laughs> well, there are lots of mentors. I've had a lot of people who've helped me along the way, and now I feel I'm doing the same thing. And, uh, but I think sometimes women need an extra bit of help. Yeah. Um, formal mentorship, um, when I joined the workforce, didn't go so well for me. Uh, but that's another story. Uh, 
for another day. Uh, so I, I haven't actually been a big fan of, of formal mentor programs. And I've observed that uh, typically people's um, need for mentorship is very situational. It's usually around going through a tough period or going through a change. Mm -hmm. And so I That's think true. the important thing is to, to reach out to people. I, I try to reach out to people, men and women. You might approach them a little differently um, when, you, when you see those situations um, coming up. Uh, for myself, um, since those formal mentorships didn't really pan out, I took it upon myself to, as, as Barbara suggested, uh, cultivate uh, a lot of informal uh, kind of mentorships. And I have different people who I view as mentors for different types of things, whether it's mm -hmm. uh, a big picture thing or a sticky management situation or uh, a pure intellectual challenge. Um, and some people, you know, are very, very good in um, several of those areas or in one area. So having that informal network of people who you personally connect with easily and who uh, you know you can call uh, when you need someone to talk to, I think is very, very important. Mm -hmm. yeah. You hear a lot of people referring to a personal board of directors that, yeah. that, uh, mm -hmm. that they have, yeah. which sounds good. Same idea. Let me go back to the side of the room. Any questions over here or not? OK, while we go ahead. Thank you for uh, being here today. A uh, question about your path to promotion and any obstacles that you may have uh, <coughs> faced in the workplace, as well as if you have a sponsor who spoke on your behalf, it was time for that opportunity. Okay. <coughs> well, um, let's see, where do we start here? <laughs> I'm not sure. Obstacles. Did you have something in particular in mind? <laughs> um, you, there may be people who may have not been yeah. Um, well, okay. Let me just tell you my philosophy about obstacles. And I've faced a lot of them. And, and it's one of the things, <laughs> back to your question earlier, what advice would you give to, to people? I, I'm glad I didn't get certain advice. And that was, it was going to be pretty tough out there. I'm glad I didn't know. <laughs> it was just better to barrel into it. Uh, my view about obstacles is that you, depends where you are. If you have the power to remove them, remove them. If you don't, then you have to find some way to go around them or circumvent them or something. <laughs> now, that's a little creative exercise sometimes. Because sometimes they're hard to remove. <laughs> but you just have to get creative. And that, so that's my bottom line. Don't let the obstacles stop you, ever. Get creative about how you can get around them or remove them. I would add being persistent and patient. Yeah. Helps. That too, yes. <laughs> two of my promotions, and I've again, been very fortunate to have lots of them, two of them happened uh, during like the month that I had my second and my third child. And those um, I understand now, and thank God I didn't know then, there, okay. were much, there was much debate about should we give her this job? <laughs> Can she handle it? And the the I understand later that many of my mentors who have been involved in this said that's not our job to make that decision. We need to offer these jobs, and if they decide that they don't want to have the job because they're going to choose how they're going to deal with different things in their mm -hmm. life at different times, that's their decision. That's not our decision. Yeah. And that's a really special company if you work for something like that. If not. It's up to all of us to be sure that, that when those conversations are being had like that, <coughs> that we that we do our best to, to level set and not make that. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Okay, we got time for one more question. Uh, why don't we take this one? Um, my question is actually around family life and balance. Okay. Um, some of you have already touched on that, and a lot of us coming here, it's a perfect time for us to reflect on how we balance work life and family life, and especially for those of you who have children, um, you know, as they get older, or even starting when they're young, you know, what are some wisdoms that you can impart on us to start thinking about that and, and really sort of take that to heart and, and start applying that to our own lives? 
Abby, you want to start? Yeah. yeah, well, I'm I'm now at the stage where uh, my kids are in high school and their schedules are just as crammed as mine and they have just as much work as I do. <laughs> so, uh, but I think that's not really in the, 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 your question is more how do you get through the, you know, the early years. I mean, I think with any, there's no silver bullet here. And it, for everybody, you just have to prioritize what you want to do with, with your time. I mean, for me, I've always just kept doing stuff. I mean, I just kept working, and the kids came along, and I made time for them. I probably traveled uh, a little bit less for a number of years while, while they were young. And I just, I just kept going, but I think it's, it is important to carve out time for your family. I mean, that's part of any healthy family life where you spend time as a family around uh, things that are important to you, whether they're specific activities. Uh, dinner time is probably the most common one, but so dinner time and, and maybe something else that you all enjoy uh, doing together. Go ahead, because I don't have, didn't have the same kind of experience. Yeah, I. Um, it's the same thing. I mean, I just you, you you sort of make it work the way that you want to work. But I think the thing that we all someone should have told me early on, or that I'm sort of still grappling with and dealing with every day. You just can't be. If you if you have any guilt that enters into the picture, you're guilty with everything. Like you're just guilty if you're not spending enough time with the kids, with the work, with the <laughs> husband, with the partner, with the friends, with the mother, with the father, with the. It doesn't matter. You can you can live your life guilty because you can't no you can't be best at all of those different things. It's really about the constitution inside to say this is what I've chosen to do. Things are going to ebb and flow. There's times when I'm going to do a little more of this and times when I'm going to do a little more of that. And if you know, I just constantly sit, ask myself, am I doing it the right way? It's never perfect, but if I go to sleep at night feeling like I've had some rewards during the day and I haven't let too many people down, then it's, uh, it's a good day. Well, well, I know yeah. you're like me. You have a ton more questions you'd love to ask these uh, panelists, but since we've uh, hit our uh, uh, witching hour here, uh, I want to say on behalf of the attendees that we really appreciate you allocating the time to do this. You inspire us. We appreciate the insights you uh, provided. And thank you so much for being here with us thank today. You.